Good evening. I'm Lee Wright, the founder of History Camp near Boston. And I'm Carrie Lund, the director of the Pursuit of History, and I am in Virginia. Tonight we have with us Dr. Sam Foreman. Thank you so much for joining us, Sam. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. Sam's joining us from New England also, and Sam has, has written several books and has a fascinating background. Sam, give us an idea of, of uh, both your background and your books, and I think we'll start talking about how that background, that unique uh, background, really informed your research and writing. Yes, uh, you know, I, I trained back in the day as an historian at the University of Pennsylvania, and uh, I majored in the history of the American Revolution, uh, the history of science, and uh, went on to a career in uh, medicine and business and in the military. Um, when I was able to, I revisited a, an extraordinary personality that I had run into decades ago in study, and that is Dr. Joseph Warren. Uh, Warren was um, perhaps a lesser known um, Boston son of liberty, very early uh, revolutionary activist in the late uh, colonial era leading up to Revolutionary War. Um, today, he's perhaps um, best known as the person who um, was the head of the Minutemen uh, in the Massachusetts Provincial Congress and sent Paul Revere on the iconic Midnight Ride. Um, at any rate, I'm expecting uh, to talk a little bit about uh, two of my books. Um, the first one uh, is uh, Dr. Joseph Warren, uh, The Boston Tea Party, uh, Bunker Hill, and the Birth of American Liberty. Uh, and then also my upcoming book, uh, Ill-Fated Frontier, Peril and Possibilities in the Early American West. Well, that's great. Now, Sam, we should just, just, just put a little finer point on this. Uh, your career in medicine was indeed as a physician, correct? Uh, yes, and, and I, I still am, and, uh, but I, I certainly took my interest in uh, the uh, history of medicine, the history of Me American Revolution with me, and uh, had, had continued uh, writing articles, et cetera, over the decades until I was able to return to it uh, about eight to ten years ago uh, full time as an historian. And that experience gave you an opportunity to learn much more about Warren by looking at his, his detailed records. Is that correct? Yes. Well, Warren was uh, both a physician uh, and a politician. And in fact, he was an active physician all the way to just within a couple of months of the end of his life, where he was a hero of the Battle of Bunker Hill in June of 1775. Uh, where he unfortunately was killed in action. So really his story, um, in addition to being a key part of patriot uh, thought and development and action in the revolutionary era, is also a physician's story. So my background, both in the history of medicine, history of science, and in the history of the American Revolution, turned out to be uh, very useful in making sense out of Warren's life. Uh, Joseph Warren's uh, most extensive cache of materials which he left uh, were records of his medical practice, uh, unlike better known uh, patriots and leaders like George Washington and Alexander Hamilton, et cetera, who have left uh, what has been systematized into volume after volume of primary source material. Uh, John Adams has a wonderful diary, as, as does his uh, wife, Abigail Adams, et cetera. You can go down the list of these key personalities uh, from that era, many of whom he knew personally and were his friends. But Warren left nothing like that. So the most voluminous materials in his own hand are the records of his medical practice. Uh, the few prior biographers knew of these documents, uh, which rest at the Massachusetts Historical Society, but treated them more as um, relics or artifacts, uh, things that this particular patriot had written, uh, rather than uh, a view uh, through a keyhole, if you will, into Joseph Warren's medical practice, and then more widely through his patients and uh, their surviving materials, um, insights into his life. 
Now, his, his role as a physician uh, put him in touch with a, a wide swath of, of society. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, the dates of his practice, um, he emerged from a, uh, an apprenticeship uh, with the leading Boston physician, uh, Dr. James Lloyd, in 1763. And Warren's practice itself um, just maps over the entire uh, pre-revolutionary period from 1763 to 1775. And in the course of that time, uh, he met and treated uh, many of the leading uh, patriots and also common people, um, enslaved servants, just a variety of people uh, that uh, he came in contact with uh, through his medical practice. And as I had mentioned before, they even included uh, some folks that you would not necessarily have suspected uh, for a leading patriot, uh, like uh, the um, uh, British appointed uh, loyalist uh, Lieutenant Governor and later Governor of Massachusetts, Hutchinson, and uh, Hutchinson's family members, amongst others. Now, I, I happen to think, and, and you have a much better perspective on this than I, but I happen to think that if, if he had not uh, been killed at the Battle of Bunker Hill, he'd be much better known. Uh, talk a little bit about the role he played and uh, help us understand kind of how that was uh, really critical in leading up to the revolution. Um, he had several roles. In fact, when I first encountered him uh, back in university, uh, I found it hard to believe that someone who passed away shortly after his 34th birthday could have on his resume leading physician in Boston, um, president of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress, head of its Committee of Safety, which uh, controlled the Minutemen of Massachusetts, um, an active member and founding member of the Boston Committee of Correspondence, uh, the leading Mason in North America through his uh, St. Andrew's Grand Lodge, um, and uh, aspiring to be a fighting major general in the army, but is not a doctor, but a fighting major general. He was on the cusp of assuming that role. So when I first encountered him, I, I just couldn't believe that all of this was true. Uh, there are legends around all of the founding figures, including Joseph Warren. And uh, when I got into researching his biography, I was expecting to debunk a lot of this. Uh, and, and separate the hype from uh, that resume that I just uh, went through. But as it turned out, it was all true and then some. So a very impressive individual. Incidentally, um, uh, some contemporaries, in addition to all those formal things on the resume, noted rather quick, cryptically that the ladies judged him handsome. And I, I deal with some speculative um, notions in the book. I'll, I'll let the scandal mongers go read the book on that one. But at any rate, there may be some basis to that. So he was, uh, uh, he was a very appealing, charismatic personality uh, in truth. Fascinating. So you said that um, one of the things, one of the actions he's uh, best known for is sending Paul Revere on his way. Talk to, talk to us a little bit about that uh, that that incident, kind of leading up to it, and so forth, and uh, and then take us to take us to Bunker Hill and what happened there. Okay. The um, now we're we're on the eve of the uh, Revolutionary War, 1774, 1775. Uh, the Boston Sons of Liberty are now operating um, uh, as part of the government of the town of Boston. Um, and they, through political maneuverings, basically had maneuvered the uh, local loyalists aside uh, from that body. And uh, Warren, um, through his roles, um, was very influential in shaping the uh, Patriot activities uh, during and following the closure of the point, port of Boston 
Those are the coercive acts of the summer of 1774 that were reprisals for the December 1773 Boston Tea Party. Uh, during that summer of 1774, uh, leading and now better known uh, patriots were working with patriots from other um, provinces and colonies to form the first Continental Congress. Joseph Warren was um, left in charge, if you will, by the other leaders in Boston. And uh, he did such things as uh, lead the committees that culminated in writing the Suffolk Resolves, um, crystallizing um, uh, opposition to British uh, tax policies and other policies of the course of act and uh, taking on a leadership role in the Massachusetts Provincial Congress in late 1774 and 75 in the absence of uh, the formally elected uh, presidents like John Hancock uh, John and, and Samuel Adams who were on their way to Philadelphia or in the fall actually in Philadelphia at the Continental Congress. Uh, coming into the uh, spring of 1775, um, uh, Warren, uh, through his um, multiple roles of not only president pro tem of the Provincial Congress, the head of its Committee of Safety, Committee of uh, Donations, and Committee of Supplies, um, was involved with uh, strengthening uh, the Patriots uh, should there be an outbreak of fighting. I don't believe it was ever his preference uh, to uh, start a war, but he was very much an advocate and involved in the nuts and bolts of um, a uh, armed deterrent, if you will, uh, to show the British that the American uh, patriots meant business in asserting their rights. All right, so um, in uh, the evening of April 18, 1775, Warren uh, learned um, through uh, mechanisms that are still uh, obscure and are the subject of legend uh, that the British intended to seize Patriot stores from their uh, base occupying Boston out towards Lexington and Concord. Uh, Warren ordered uh, on his own authority the uh, mobilization of the Massachusetts Patriot militia and the Minutemen to um, face the uh, British column as it approached uh, Concord. Um, he dispatched Paul Revere and William Dawes to pass the word, uh, which we know uh, through um, legend based on fact as the uh, Redcoats are coming or less accurately, the British are coming as Paul Revere's message uh, and also a parallel uh, message system out to the Patriots of Lexington and Concord and other towns of lanterns being hung in the old North Church uh, of one if the British were coming by land and two if by sea. Uh, after the uh, battles of Lexington and Concord, the British were chased back into Boston and a siege materialized. Uh, Warren was, although a civilian, uh, was the glue that kept the Patriot Army together in its ragtag uh, fashion, having been mobilized, penning up the British in Boston. Uh, Warren, uh, as were other leading politicians, were advocates uh, that the Continental Congress um, uh, establish an army and uh, put General George Washington in charge. Warren was supportive of that, but uh, it was going to take George uh, a little while to get to Boston, which was the see scene of action and uh, warlike activities uh, at that point. So um, even advance, weeks in advance of George Washington uh, arriving, uh, the Patriots again got intelligence this time that the British intended to fortify uh, hills outside of Boston. The Patriots uh, gathered their militia officers and Warren 
and together decided to fortify uh, Bunker Hill preemptively, which was very close to Boston across the Mystic River. Um, Joseph Warren uh, had been appointed by that time uh, under his own uh, advocacy that he be appointed a fighting ma major general, but that had not yet been confirmed by the Provincial Congress. So he went out to the battlefield and uh, declared to the officers on the spot, um, including uh, Colonel Prescott um, and uh, um, the uh, Putnam, I believe, um, that uh, he was going to fight as a common soldier, basically under their tutelage until he could be perform uh, confirmed in his role. So he certainly was a person of action and was prepared perhaps even impetuously to practice what he preached. Uh, and uh, he uh, went to the hottest uh, part of the action and uh, was killed in action towards the end of the battle. People may know the, the famous, I think, Trumbull painting, is that right? Uh, with, with Warren at the, at the center and uh, uh, a uh, British soldier with a, a bayonet uh, held over him and Yes, Lee, that, that uh, painting, it shows up in virtually all of the textbooks of uh, the American Revolution uh, and American history. And its original title is kind of sad under the circumstances. The original title uh, was called The Death of Major General Joseph Warren uh, at Bunker Hill on June 17, 1775. That has been truncated over the years to uh, the Battle of Bunker Hill. Uh, John Trumbull, uh, the painter, um, was an, an eyewitness to the battle, albeit uh, some hundreds of yards away. And when he painted the painting in the mid-1780s, he took great pains to um, have real likenesses of the survivors who agreed to sit for him in the case of some of the British officers who were killed, uh, their uh, likely appearing uh, children or, or brothers, if you will. And for uh, Joseph Warren, apparently, uh, that image was modeled on a, a painting by um, John Singleton Copley. So at any rate, uh, that is probably the earliest of these icons of the American Revolution. Uh, including uh, Washington crossing the Delaware and uh, the surrender at Yorktown and a number of other ones uh, that uh, even appear in enlarged form in the rotunda of the U.S. Capitol. Um, and this, this painting by Trumbull is the earliest of all of them, uh, having been painted by an eyewitness within 10 years of the events. That is fascinating. So there's another aspect that I, I know we wanted to get to, and uh, it ties into some recurrent events as it relates to the, uh, the, the, the COVID-19 virus. Now, you've done some, some research about earlier um, colonial era uh, epidemics and so forth, uh, including the, the uh, 1764 uh, incident, epidemic, is that correct? Yes. Let me tell you a little bit about um, about what happened, uh, which you know might have been kind of an obscure bit of medical history, but in light of current events, I think um, uh, major epidemic outbreaks in American history and how Americans uh, responded to that is of more than passing interest at the current time. Now, let me give you a little bit of context. Um, we're going to talk about an epidemic of smallpox, uh, which was the scourge of the 18th century, which occurred in uh, Boston in 1764. And this corresponded to Joseph Warren cutting his eye teeth, if you will, uh, on a large scale medical issue, him not having been in private practice for uh, yet a year at the time, and assuming a, a leadership role uh, in the response. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, what even teed up 1764. So now Boston is uh, one of the top five or 10 uh, metropolitan areas in the British Empire. Uh, 
uh, in the mid 18th century. But even at that, uh, where London has a population of maybe a half million or more, uh, Boston's population in 1764 was probably around 13,000. Another couple hundred thousand uh, live uh, distributed in small market towns and on farms uh, throughout the province uh, of Massachusetts. But even back in 1720, um, Boston uh, was a leader in uh, the clinical and public health response to the epidemic disease. Uh, Cotton Mather, and he was not a physician, but a, uh, a famous uh, divine of a multi-generational Mother family, dating back into the 17th century and even the witch trials, um, what, uh, was, very, was actually quite open-minded and spoke to his slave, Osemius, who told him, uh, the, this enslaved servant, uh, told him that there was this practice of inoculation against smallpox uh, coming from where he grew up before uh, the slave was kidnapped in West Africa, where uh, people with active smallpox um, would um, have their pox, these pustules, um, opened by a physician and inoculated into a per deliberately into a person who had never had smallpox before. And the assertion was that the in inoculated, artificially inoculated smallpox would have a less deadly course than if you caught the disease while in the community. There was a separate line of evidence around the same time uh, coming in from the British consul in um, the Ottoman Empire, uh, where apparently they, there, there were similar practices being carried out. So Cotton Mather got together with a leading physician at the time, Dr. Boylston, and together this, this religious and medical partnership uh, proceeded to inoculate several hundred individuals, uh, including Mather's family and the slave's family and, and a number of other volunteers. And lo and behold, the mortality rate amongst the deliberately inoculated smallpox. And this was live, live smallpox. You know, it's like wild by current lines of thought. Uh, had a mortality rate of about 2%, and it was over 25% if you caught it wild. Um, uh, Boston uh, had um, experienced other smallpox epidemics in uh, 1730, I believe, 1752. And each time, at the outbreak of the earliest cases, uh, physicians were allowed to offer this inoculation uh, and, and through that blunted the um, impact of this otherwise uncontrolled outbreak. So in 1764, uh, physicians who studied uh, carefully were uh, knowledgeable about previous observations of smallpox. Now, mind you, they have no idea at the time of what a virus is, much less what variola virus that causes smallpox is. Uh, knowledge of germ theory is well over a century. It wasn't even part of what might pass for science fiction at the time. However, they, the physicians were very careful um, about observing the, out, the course of the disease and its outcome. So simply, with, this is without lab tests or anything, simply from observation shared from these previous experiences and in um, uh, journals uh, like the science journals coming out of London, which were read by, uh, by some of the more educated physicians like Warren, um, knew that once one contracted smallpox, if you did not die outright, you had a lifetime immunity. You might have these pox scars, uh, but uh, even those were much less if you had the deliberate inoculation. They knew that people were infectious for passing the disease while the pox were present, and that once the last pox had 
healed, the person could no longer pass the disease and they were in fact immune. So Joseph Warren, um, junior physician, got together with his mentor in 1764 and some other physicians to form a company after the first couple of cases uh, broke out in late January of 1764. And this, this company uh, sought out and um, was, was successful in collaborating with the government of Massachusetts and of the town of Boston to set up the infrastructure. Well, mind you, there, there's no such thing as a Department of Public Health or even a full-time hospital to marshal existing resources to be able to inoculate the, the population of Boston who had not survived these uh, previous epidemics and were now immune, but uh, the uh, folks who were still susceptible to inoculate them on a large scale. Now, inoculating smallpox, even this clinical deliberate inoculation is extremely dangerous for the patient because they have smallpox, but they can also pass it to other people while they're um, uh, recovering from the disease. So not only did you have the clinical activity of uh, inoculating uh, uh, people, but you also had to isolate them for the course of their disease. So with the cooperation of the province and the town of Boston, uh, the um, little used uh, fort at Castle William was established as an inoculation hospital. Uh, Joseph Warren and another colleague, Dr. Gelston, were the house physicians. Individuals who were going to be immunized, or excuse me, inoculated, would, would pay their fee, two pounds flat rate, to their private doctors, and then they would travel to the inoculation hospital, where they would be sequestered uh, under the care of Warren, who would inoculate them, and then with a staff of people who had had the disease before, nurse them uh, to health and only release them from the hospital, which had a military guard, incidentally, um, after they recovered. So once you went into this hospital and Warren was resident there, um, there were only two ways to come out. And that is in a pine box dead or uh, basically uh, having survived the disease, totally immune and returned to the community. Um, in the course of this campaign, uh, I believe about 4,000, uh, that is well over a third, of the population of Boston was inoculated. The inoculations were offered um, first to paying patients and then very shortly after free to all comers. Miraculously, uh, at Joseph Warren's um, hospital where he was resident as, as a junior physician, house physician, if you will. Uh, no one died, that is everybody survived, which was thought to be miraculous and much to his uh, account and um, uh, reputation as a doctor. Um, and uh, in fact, the total mortality across the board uh, for the inoculated people was less than 1%. There were still people in the community and staying a uh, lot being inoculated, and uh, the mortality rate was being tracked by uh, newspaper editors who, of course, they didn't have any lab tests, but they did have a very strong um, endpoint. It was very obvious who had the smallpox because of appearance, and they were counting uh, funerals, uh, talking to the churches as to uh, who died and were being given the last rights. So we have pretty good statistical uh, results, which I uh, actually uh, listed in the table in my book, um, about uh, the success of this campaign. Um, the epidemic was blunted, and virtually the majority of the uh, population of Boston uh, was inoculated successfully. 
and then others who were older already were immune from the prior epidemics. So Boston was on the forefront of uh, medicine and uh, public health initiatives at the time. A couple of takeaways, um, uh, first about Warren in particular, and then more widely about its implications. For Warren in particular, uh, he, uh, his um, reputation was greatly enhanced. Now he may not have been um, inoculated himself, that's unclear. And if he wasn't, that was an extremely um, audacious thing to do, to volunteer to be a house physician and treat hundreds of active smallpox uh, patients. Those patients, uh, even um, the majority of them were patients of other doctors, other uh, much more experienced uh, and leading doctors in Boston, like Dr. Lloyd, um, uh, were in intimate contact with Warren and as I had mentioned, they included leading uh, loyalists, uh, lieutenant, uh, the lieutenant governor's children, and that sort of thing. So uh, Warren's humanity, I think, came across to them and just enhanced these links that he had across uh, society. Um, in a more general sense, and I think this is where I, I think the learnings for today come. Um, the, the actual details of the medical practice uh, of inoculating with live smallpox virus uh, seems uh, arcane, perhaps bizarre uh, to a modern um, uh, observer. But uh, once you actually um, get into the context of this, uh, what you're seeing is the best available um, approach to blunting or reversing an epidemic, uh, the best scientific knowledge at the time. And it was quite effective if you're given the choice between a treatment with 1% mortality versus 20 to 25% mortality of, of catching this wild, uh, you're very grateful. And in fact, there are very engaging and firsthand um, diary and letter type accounts of uh, the inoculation of um, John Adams, the future president and, and then uh, son of liberty. Um, and uh, in, in several years later, uh, Abigail Adams uh, overseeing the inoculation of her family and herself. Um, this is uh, not a quick uh, immunization like we'd be used to. I mean, basically you're being inoculated and you get the disease uh, and you have to recover for it. So this is a period of weeks, even months, before uh, you're finished and considered uh, immune. But this partnership between um, religious leaders that dates back in the 1720s uh, and the uh, leading med medical practitioners and scientists is a hallmark uh, of these epidemic controls, of which I think the most dramatic is 1764. And I, I, I think that, um, I don't editorialize in the book, of course, but I think if we're looking for learnings today, uh, this idea of um, uh, seeking out and respecting the best science and uh, synergizing with government, you know, to make these smallpox hospitals happen and enforce the uh, quarantines and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and, and the synergy with religious leaders, um, that uh, that was a very powerful combination. That even with medicine that we would consider so primitive, uh, that could um, uh, control an epidemic and even immunize uh, the vast majority of the population. Now, when we look at today for this COVID-19 thing, when you have a disease that doesn't yet have effective treatments and uh, has no immunization, uh, these um, rather blunt tools from prior epidemics, be they 1764 or the pandemic of 1918, are not to be dismissed and I think are to be taken seriously and uh, are 
uh, clinical leaders uh, like Dr. Fauci and the Surgeon General and Dr. Birx uh, do just that. Um, although the messages, I, I think, from our political leaders, um, you know, are, are, are less consistent and, and at worst sometimes muddled. That was not the case in 1764. That is, that is fascinating, Sam. Now, <clears throat> on, on a future future visit, um, let's let's kind of play that forward and talk about the the impact on uh, on, on on battles, uh, some of the some of the uh, uh, the way in which that might have influenced the outcome. But what I would like to do is let's switch gears to ill-fated frontier. Now, when you first uh, mentioned that to me, I imagine uh, the, the West that I that I uh, saw on TV as a kid, and that, of course, is, you know, the Dakotas and Arizona and so forth, right? And and it wasn't until moving to New England and, and, and driving down Boston Post Road and seeing uh, King Philip Historic District and learning a little bit about, and it seems like this, not necessarily where you, well, uh, you're a little ways out of Boston, as am I. You know, this is the frontier. So tell us about your fated frontier. Well, um, I uh, ran into this um, true story more or less by accident. Uh, there was a reader of the Warren biography who was very enthusiastic about it, who, who asked me, uh, well, you must be of the Foreman family uh, from um, the Revolutionary War era Foreman family of uh, Pennsylvania and New Jersey. I didn't know what they were talking about, I've heard of such a thing. And uh, the, the, the reader actually sent me a, a diary that had been published in the 19th century of a pioneer group who had uh, departed uh, from New Jersey to uh, travel across the then entire frontier uh, which is sometimes called the Trans-Allegheny Frontier. And that is down the Ohio River uh, to the west and then south to what was then not even part of the United States. So I read this diary of a plantation entrepreneur and I was just fascinated by it. Uh, coincidentally, the, the animated character behind, not character, but actual historical figure behind it, was uh, a, a minor general of the Revolutionary War who thought very highly of himself, uh, General uh, David Foreman, Black David Foreman. The reason why they called him Black David is that uh, he was uh, kind of an enforcer and eyes and ears, if you will, of George Washington during a very dirty guerrilla war um, in northern New Jersey late in the Revolutionary War. So he... Um, uh, he, his prospects were not up to his own expectations in, immediately after the Revolutionary War, and he decided that he would assign family members uh, to set up plantation in uh, Spanish West Florida. So this is like modern Mississippi and Alabama, and he got a free land, land, land grant to do that. Uh, in some ways, he was not as upstanding a person as Joseph Warren or a number of other folks. One of the reasons why he did this is that he had uh, an enslaved plantation in Monmouth, New Jersey with 60 uh, Afro-American uh, servants, as he called them. They were slaves. So this is a large-scale enslaved plantation in New Jersey, not something that we picture nowadays. And uh, he decided that uh, looking across into Pennsylvania, where there was some early slow emancipation laws being passed in 1780, uh, even earlier um, in uh, uh, Massachusetts, that the handwriting was on the wall and that his uh, position as a slave owner uh, was not viable for the long term. So uh, I, he did maybe not what you or I might, but he decided to go to somewhere much friendlier to the region of slavery and dispatched family members um, remove the slaves across the entire frontier to uh, Spanish West. Uh, it is an epic journey, 2,400 miles during the Northwest Indian War. When the Indians had the upper hand, uh, it, in some ways it was intrepid, in other ways it was insane. 
Um, the uh, and so what what I saw just just to give an overview, what got me excited by this account was that it was actually four parallel stories that together were an origin story of a good part of the United States, uh, chiefly the uh, midsection, if you will. That the four stories were of the plantation uh, entrepreneurs who were uh, Eastern, Northerners, basically. And then there were their enslaved Afro-Americans, a large number of them. I mean, so, so much so that when they got to Natchez, which was thinly populated at the time, just their arrival increased the entire population of Mississippi by 3%. <laughs> and then it was also the story of Native Americans, Indians, who were fiercely resisting the, these pioneering kind of ventures. And there were some very inspiring and little known to me, uh, Indian leaders who opposed, violently opposed uh, these ventures. And then when the group got to uh, Natchez, the uh, Spanish who were in charge there, this was Spanish Louisiana, um, were to me at least surprisingly or urbane, effective, educated, um, really incredible characters. Uh, and and I, I talk about Manuel Gueso de Lemos, uh, who was um, a real charmer and extremely effective. The Americans renounced their citizenship, became uh, Spanish citizens, and the story goes from there. Um, I don't want to do spoilers, but the, uh, <laughs> the story uh, is not only a rollicking pioneer adventure, um, but it is set in, in a less known time, this trans-Allegheny West, but one that I believe is quite foundational to the United States today. Uh, this trans-Allegheny West of the states that adjoin the Ohio River, both north and south, and then south through the Mississippi River into the Delta, uh, is the area of the country that uh, is involved in this saga, which is you know, entirely nonfiction. But it, it actually maps over what we might call Trump territory and um, things that uh, uh, have impact into the electoral uh, map today, much better than the um, divisions of the American Civil War. Um, so I, I just kind of got that gestalt, uh, not that I was going to editorialize about this explicitly, but rather that this was an important story. So not only is it a, um, a Western, if you will, trans-Allegheny Western pioneer adventure, has some unbelievable and true episodes that I think are more outlandish than anything you can make up, uh, of the adventures of this um, enslaved wagon train and then flatboats uh, traversing the frontier. Uh, but, it's, but it's also, um, I think, a recasting, if you will, um, of the uh, nonfiction genre of uh, the West, where people of color, Afro-Americans, Native Americans, uh, Latino Americans, are in every way in integral to this story. They're not tacked on. They, they are the story, uh, in addition to perhaps the slightly better known view of the plantation entrepreneurs. Um, I don't want to be a, a spoiler about this, but the family itself uh, becomes colossally uh, um, successful in Mississippi. Um, the, the ownership over the, plant, the new plantations and the slaves become uh, the subject of a family feud. Um, members of the, of the extended family come down from New Jersey to claim their ownership. Um, one of them ends up quite dead and pickled in a barrel of rum and, and, and from which he returns to uh, New Jersey and uh, a number of other, uh, you know, just fascinating uh, parts of this nonfiction tale. And then, uh, like I say, the wider significance, I think of just understanding 
through what I hope is a rollicking Western adventure, uh, the, the origins of uh, that part of the United States. That sounds very interesting, Sam. When is that book going to be out? Um, it's, uh, it's slated uh, to come out um, under the Lions Press imprint of Roman and Littlefield in 2021. Great, great. We'll, we'll have to have you back and, and you can take us through through more of that. Um, I think we've got some questions. I think Carrie's going to join us uh, in, in just a minute uh, and, and uh, go through some of those questions. But before we do, I want to thank you, Sam. You are uh, one of the one of the people that I approached uh, very early on and said I've got this idea called History Camp. And uh, you were one of the three people who said, uh, we don't know what this is, uh, but let's see what we can create. And we're such a good sport, so positive, and have every single year been been, been so supportive and encouraging to to History Camp, and and then now to the nonprofit organization, the Pursuit of History, that that is uh, supporting and, and putting on History Camp. So thank you, Sam. Uh, you're welcome, Lee uh, and Carrie. Um... You're embarrassing me. Uh, thank you for the kind words. Absolutely. Carrie, questions? We do have some good questions. So Bev wants to know if there were epidemics in the revolutionary era, in the Maine era, which was part of Northern Massachusetts. Um, Maine, uh, which, uh, as you say, was a Northern precincts of Massachusetts until 1820. And it became a separate state, uh, was on the whole pretty sparsely populated. Um, so uh, especially outside of a few of the coastal cities, uh, it was considered a, a, a kind of a frontier. Uh, it's not well documented. I think the best work that, that, that I, I can share uh, is by uh, Harvard professor Laurel Ulreich, who uh, has written The Midwife's Tale. The Midwife's Tale is a wonderfully engaging uh, history of a uh, practitioner of, of medicine and midwifery uh, on the main frontier. But then somewhat later time frame, it's 1785 to 1812 uh, or so. And if you read that, you can see how wild and sparse that territory was just outside of the coastal towns, which weren't very big either compared to, say, Boston. Um, now, that being said, uh, uh, we're, we're into conjecture. Um, epidemics thrive on people clustered together, whether that be by war, by poverty, or by other factors. Partying on the beach or something in, in uh, <laughs> Memorial Day. And uh, so when you're dealing with dispersed populations, and a frontier, it's, it's kind of hard to get a, an epide epidemic going. Uh, now, if you are an Indian tribe of the Abenaki Indians who are still native to that territory, and you had towns of some hundreds of people, maybe even thousands of times, they would uh, have a population density higher than distributed uh, pioneers in the 18th century. So it's quite possible, even probable, that epidemic diseases struck and d decimated Abenaki towns, much they did uh, for other Native Americans in other parts of the country. However, to my knowledge, those kind of epidemics for Maine either are not documented or possibly didn't happen. Right? Now, there is a little bit more to the story that I'll share uh, for, uh, for our, um, uh, our listener here. Um, the um, Benedict Arnold uh, led a, an attack on Quebec in the fall of 1775. It was a very audacious thing to do. He branched off uh, from George Washington's army during the Siege of Boston to do this uh, and took over a thousand uh, soldiers north through Maine. So they marched up the Penobscot, went on land, and went entirely through the northern Maine frontier. 
the, they were um, decimated uh, en route by the cold. They started out in late November and by um, starvation, not so much disease. But when they got to Quebec, the travails were only starting. Um, they, they attacked Quebec, uh, I believe, on the Christmas uh, on Christmas of 1775. They did not have heavy guns. The attack failed. Uh, they continued the siege. And the point for this discussion is by February of 1776, smallpox broke out in the American camp and besieging Quebec killed a number of Americans, disabled them. Uh, it was so bad that any hope of prevailing over the British besieged in Quebec um, uh, failed. Uh, so when the British by March and April were um, resupplied, the British broke out and chased the Americans away. Um, so there's Maine in the story. Thank you. Okay, Sarah said that she was just recently in the burial ground in Lexington, Massachusetts, and she noticed the gravestones of six children from the same family that died in August and September of 1778. Was there a smallpox epidemic during that time that you're aware of? Uh, no, um, and I am familiar uh, with that uh, gravestone in uh, ye old burial grounds, they call it, and it, it's, it's very sad. I mean, it, it's, I, I can't think of anything quite like it. But uh, you have the children listed by names and ages, all dying, all very close together. And you could just imagine uh, the, um, uh, the sadness of that family, even during an age where and, uh, here and there were not necessarily expected to entirely a family's worth of children to survive childhood, but to have a whole family designated like that. There were a number of uh, small epidemic diseases um, uh, going around New England uh, in 1778, indeed every year. Uh, they did more by the symptoms, you know, since of course the uh, physicians did not know the germ causes. But they probably, in modern terms, were things like pertussis, uh, whooping cough, scarlet fever, um, measles, uh, a number of diseases, um, which would uh, have small epidemics that would go through a town and kill a number of people, but not sort of go uh, exponential and involve an entire region. So I don't know. Um, in, in being Lexington, uh, there may be some clinical description of what that family suffered that I'm not familiar with, but I believe it was not smallpox. It was probably one of these other uh, childhood diseases, which tended to be seasonal, hence the, the, the very tight uh, time frame. Uh, and, and of course, uh, highly infectious for family members. And they were on, uh, sadly, on the wrong end of that. Right. Okay. Carol says that she's been reading Bellevue by David Oshinsky, and it sounds like they were still experimenting with inoculations into the early 1900s. Can you tell us a little bit about the transition from inoculation with the live disease to what we have today in immunization? Yes. And uh, I'm going to lay some terms on you, which ordinarily I'd be embarrassed to do, but I think to understand the everyday news, I, I think you have to have a, um, a degree in epidemiology or listen very closely to Dr. Fauci, I would say. But at any rate, uh, in 1798, uh, Dr. Jenner, uh, who is a physician in England, noticed that uh, milkmaids uh, tended to uh, have very nice complexions. In fact, uh, the, the common uh, word was milkmaids are prettier than other girls because they tend not to have the pox. And uh, when he looked at it more closely and, and, and talked to some of the farmers, uh, there was a notion that it might have been uh, uh, a cowpox that uh, 
that was somehow protecting the milkmaids uh, against uh, smallpox. So he experimented with this and inoculated people who had never had smallpox before with cowpox, and lo and be which caused a very minor infection on, on their arm or wherever they were inoculated. And uh, then they would seem to be immune to smallpox. There's a cross reactivity there. Again, it was observational. They didn't have any microscopes. They didn't know that what viruses they were dealing with exactly, but uh, were very careful uh, so far as their observation and uh, concluding things from the observation. So it became, within a year or so, it was, became apparent that this uh, cowpox um, uh, inoculation immunized you against smallpox. So inoculation, the definition of inoculation, is to have the live disease, smallpox in this case, like Dr. Warren was doing in 1764, deliberately uh, injected, basically, or, or cut into the skin of a person who's never had that before and induce a case of smallpox, hopefully a, a mild one, and that's how you would get immune. Inoculation deals with the actual disease, smallpox. Immunization takes another tact, cowpox in this case, to prevent you from being susceptible to smallpox to begin with. So you never have smallpox, you have um, cowpox. And that's the immunization. Now, um, that improvement came to America quite quickly, given the communications of the day. So there were American physicians uh, communicating with their British colleagues uh, professionally, even though politically we weren't so you know, smooth with England at the time. The professional communications were continuing. And um, uh, Jenner himself uh, uh, exported some uh, cowpox material to uh, leading physicians in the United States, so that by, by 1801, there were active immunization campaigns going on in the United States. It took a few more years for um, the cowpox immunization to completely replace the smallpox inoculation. But this came about, for the time, rather quickly with just a couple of years. And, and one of the reasons why was that the inoculation with smallpox uh, had people handle the active disease, uh, needing to be isolated, quarantined, and, and a significant mortality of one to 2% just from the inoc inoculation. Whereas the cowpox um, was, benign. It was, you know, one or two people may have died from it, but that would have been this, the exception. So the cowpox was much less uh, mortal and much less uh, fallout from it. You didn't need these isolation hospitals. You're almost guaranteed to survive. So it was a very rapid changeover in the 18 aughts in the United States from inoculation to immunization. Okay, great. Definitely sounds better. <laughs> this has been very enlightening. Great discussion. And I'm sorry we were not able to get to all of the questions tonight. We are out of time. So we will try to get some answers over to you if we did not get to your question. Thank you, Sam, for being with us tonight. And thank you to everyone who joined us. Next week, we will be talking with author Steve Knott about his book, The Lost Soul of the American Presidency. So that is June 4th at 8 p.m. right here on our Facebook channel. You can find out more on our website, historycamp.org slash online, and you can join us here next week. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye now. <laughs>